Thank you, Lynn, and greetings, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome Anders Kronwall. Anders Kronwall is the State Secretary at the Swedish Ministry of Environment. Between 2019 and 2021, he was political expert at the Prime Minister's Committee. He has also served as the political secretary for the Social Democrats' Committee on Environment and Agriculture. Let me now invite Anders Kronwall for the keynote speech, after which the audience will have opportunity to ask questions for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you for letting me come here today. Um, since this is a policy maker keynote, uh, I'm not going to start with the basic science or on climate and environment, as one often does. Uh, I don't need to emphasize in this group uh, the seriousness of the crisis of environment and climate. I think you're all aware of that. So instead, I go directly to politics. Uh, <clears throat> just as science doesn't move in a straight line, uh, politics um, goes backwards sometimes. Uh, you mentioned the nice development, the good development we had since 1972, but it's always not a straight line. Sometimes it's going backwards. And right now, it's going backwards in Sweden. Um, ah, and I'm afraid you have to brace yourself because some more things will maybe come, depending on election and so. Let me take some examples. <laughs> not long time ago in the parliament, Riksdagen, uh, a majority decided on an announcement, it's called in, I don't know the English name, but it means that the, government, the Riksdagen tells the government to do something. And they said that every time you start a new national uh, reserve, nature reserve, if you decide to reserve this part of the nature, you have to take away another. So there won't be more than the same. So you can't increase the reserved area. You have to take away an old one. And that's a majority in the government, in the Riksdagen. Second, the requirements to blend in biofuels in diesel and petrol was decided by all the parties together. Good thing. Let's do it reduces the carbon emissions a lot. Now, there's a majority to take away. Take away it. We won't do it, I promise. <laughs> but there is a majority in the government, in the Riksdagen, so. Uh, third thing, windmills. We have had an enormous expansion of windmills in Sweden. It's very important for uh, having renewable energy. Now, the development have stopped because the local authorities says no. Even if the windmills are way out in the sea and you might see them come up behind the horizon, no. It's a problem. And uh, the government put a decision on the, on the Riksdagen, the parliament, uh, some weeks ago to change the system, making the local authorities to have a decision faster and have to uh, communicate it better. Uh, but now, now there's a majority in the government to stop, stop it because they want to, uh, they don't want the expansion of windmills any longer. So it's a strange time, and uh, in many days, as and as mentioned, it's also 50 years since the UN Conference on Human Environment here in Stockholm. And in this summer, in June 2nd to 3rd, we celebrate it with an international meeting, Stockholm Plus 50, a UN meeting. Uh, 
And of course, some will say it's going to be more of the same. Some will even say it's only, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I will tell you why it's, imp it's an important meeting. And to do so, I have to go back to 1972 and the UN Conference on Human Environment. Perhaps many of you heard the speech Olaf Palme gave. It's on YouTube, it's just to <laughs> click, you can hear it, or you can read it on the internet. One thing, thing he mentioned, uh, some maybe had noticed, was that he indicated that the solution to many of the problems was nuclear power. Okay. I don't, I think we need to see the context of the time and understand what he means. And what he means, according to my analysis, is that maybe it's not so important which technology he's pointing out. Instead, more precisely, that he turns to the technical research and development and orders a solution. Technical, technology uh, optimism, I will call it in Sweden. I don't, Swedish, I don't know if it's an <laughs> accurate English expression. Uh, uh, you can wonder if it also means that it's turning to the market and saying, let's make the market solve this. Uh, To get the answer to that, I think we'll have to uh, read the whole speech <laughs> and absolutely the ending of the speech. It's a very famous ending, very famous words quoted all the time. I quote it all the time and I'm going to s quote it <laughs> all the time so long as I work with this question. He said, our future is common we must share it together, we must shape it together. That was the ending of the speech. And this is, of course, very political. Common solution, that's social democrat. International solidar solidarity, that's Olof Palme, of course. It also means not to rely on the market, but doing it together. So he orders the solution both from the market and the technology, the innovations, but he wants to do it with political tools. And I think there's the difference between different political movements, how much you want to do with political tools and how much you want to leave to the market. Many may say that not enough has happened since 1972. A lot have ha has happened, as you said, but not enough. I think we can agree on that. And it's actually a bit terrible if you think that they were aware of the problem. If you read the speech, you can feel, and all the speeches from the conference, you can feel that they were aware of the problem. But despite that, we still are where we are today, far from the solution. Did you know that the greenhouse gases emission con to continued to increase in, in 2021 and actually were higher than 2019? So they dipped a bit on the pandemic, but still going up. I don't think it's so simple to judge the participants in the Stockholm Conference 1972. Firstly, science was not giving as much in-depth basis as we have now. Secondly, there is a growth and population development. We are twice as many, actually, on this earth than they were 1972. And we still have the same resources and a completely different uh, global standard of living. The problem has reached uh, a completely different dimension now than 1972, that's for sure. And the risk of the collapse of the civilization is obvious today. It may have not have been the same in 1972, uh, but uh, it's been easy to deal with politically. It wasn't so easy to deal with politically in 1972. 
especially as there were more acute uh, threats of extinction, like the, the, the Cold War. So, many things have happened since then, I said, uh, but mm, many of the most uh, So, uh, let me wrap it up, <laughs> actually, because uh, what do we need to do? This is lots of things, of course, because uh, as many have pointed out, even since 1972, it's not uh, one thing, the, the one who clings to dependency on fossil fuels, who is the winner, is the one who creates the new technology and is the forefront of the transition. And now something interesting is happening in Sweden. Our industry is actually creating the innovations that the world demands. Yes, we have the solutions here in Sweden. Here, politics and some national conditions, you know, the rivers. Uh, and great awareness of the climate issue. Uh, this has built up since 1972 and uh, made us uh, very credible, and I think we have to show this to the rest of the world. All we have worked for since 1972 is now bearing fruit, actually. We are the winners, I used to say. Thousands of jobs are being made right now. And that's how we close the emission gap, by showing this to the rest of the world, selling this story of success, by focusing on the opportunities here and now. We can show the world that climate action can create jobs and growth. The old and dirty, dirty gets <laughs> out done. For me, the meeting in Stockholm plus 50 is a chance to do this. That, that's the most important action, sell this story. And we are the winners, and we are sorry for the losers. We did, you, they didn't see the, the change coming fast enough. And this is what, exactly what Palme also thought and said in his speech. He saw this, but it took a lot longer time than he might have think thought about. And I don't think that the nuclear power in 70s technology is the solution, but modern technology is. It's really urgent, Olaf Palmer said. I think it feels difficult to hear him say that, actually. With the knowledge where we are today, if the word world have, had acted, then we would have been able to secure the future in a better way. But I don't believe we can win a stronger opinion for change without selling the benefits of the change. And that was, uh, and we also have to have a fair trans transition, of course, where everyone is included. And then I'm talking about both countries and people, of course, just like Palma did. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very interesting perspective. And I, I mean, I think all of us would agree that it is together that we shape the future. Uh, we have time for a few questions, maybe two questions. And if you could take those two questions together, then maybe you could go ahead and answer. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. My name is Alexander Pohl. Um, I'm a former London banker, uh, very strong on the market, sustainable finance. I also made a film called Headwind 21, which explores the purpose of these policies. Uh, we talk about um, wind power in Sweden, for example. Uh, what is wind power in Sweden solving for? Uh, you talk about technology. Uh, Wind power in Sweden is destroying jobs in the countryside. Uh, it's affecting communities. 
uh, many of the jobs that are created are temporary and uh, staffed by foreign workers, etc. It's almost as if we're solving for a world where people and nature don't matter, but it's all about technology. So E.F. Schumacher is a famous economist from the 70s. He, he sadly died in 74, I believe. He wrote a book which is called Small is Beautiful. And it's all about appropriate technology rather than technology for technology's sake. So is Sweden's policy to solve for a future where machines and automation and high technology thrives? Or is it a, a future where the natural foundation, humans, nature, plants, animals, et cetera, thrive? Because you cannot have both. Technology has proven that it comes at the cost of nature, Gallic mine, uh, a lot of the rare earth mining processes which are fundamental for the green transition are incompatible with life. So I, I appreciate that Sweden has done great work over the last 50 years. It certainly has influenced the world. But what world is that that you are solving for? Thank you. I think we had another question at the back. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, Rolf Lindahl from Greenpeace. A similar question in a way. Um, a lot of things has happened, um, and I agree with you that uh, unfortunately uh, some things are going backwards as well, while we need to take major steps forward. Uh, listening to the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, IPCC, it is more or less a revolutionary uh, conclusion they have that we need to transform the society in a, in a speed that has not been seen before. We don't need uh, uh, reforms, we need a revolution rather. Um, and um, uh, I also wonder, uh, you're talking about uh, the green growth idea and that really don't really mat match up with, the, with the, the things we need to do, the changes we need to do. How is Sweden, um, what are the system change approaches Sweden is taking forward to, to address the urgent situation that we are facing today? Yes, uh, as I said, it's all about technology. And I <laughs> mean, won't change that. Uh, the windmills. We need electricity because we have to stop using fossil fuels. And to stop fossil fuels, we have to change a lot of technology to electric te technology. Uh, the steel industry is the biggest emitter in Sweden. Uh, the traffic, of course, is the third of the emissions. It's, there is no other way than electricity. A lot of electricity. And you can't imagine it's a really a lot of electricity. So we have to build a lot of windmills. And we have to build them in the sea, and we have to build them on mountains, and people will get angry because they're blocking their view or anything, but I don't see an alternative. The alternative is disaster. The alternative is two degrees, three degrees, and then fast moving on. You know, six degrees come fast, and then extinction. So that's my answer to, to this question. And uh, to your question, <coughs> you can't change anything if you don't have a majority behind you. You can't, uh, sometimes you have to compromise a lot to get where you want to go. So I can say, yes, we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide by 2030 instead of 2045, that's our goal tonight. 
but I don't going to have a majority in the parliament for that. And I don't have the majority in the people yet. So you have to work harder, <laughs> really, to get the people to understand the crisis. So uh, we, the politicians, can base uh, what we do and do it in together, as I said. We have to do it together, and that means together. So that's what politics is about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, State Secretary. So please. Um.